we'll make we'll make it official and, and call this meeting to order. Hello, everyone. It's good to see some of your faces. It's kind of sad that networking these days consists of like scrolling through the little windows to see who, who's watching, who's watching you and I call that networking, but better than nothing. I think it's, it's still good to be here with you guys. Uh, just some, some quick pieces of business. We are recording the meeting, so don't say anything you don't want <laughs> repeated, <laughs> I guess. Um, and we'll make those recordings available, of course, to folks who didn't make it. Um, and uh, kind of the same, same notes I've been saying in terms of announcements, guys. Um, our newsletter has a lot of uh, information about resources available to you. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that we kind of keep reminding ourselves that one of the silver linings of, of the Zoom experience is that uh, we're not limited to networking in our own town anymore. Um, and so you can hop on chapters like New York who are doing meetings like this on a near weekly basis, I think. A lot of the bigger chapters are, are meeting quite frequently and, and a lot of fantastic content and speakers on a national level. Not that we don't have fantastic speakers here. We, we have an amazing uh, realm of talent we gather in Colorado and, and uh, in Colorado Springs alone, but uh, the whole world is our oyster these days. And, and that's the up, upside of, of Zoom and, and absolutely take advantage of what national HSMAI and, and the other uh, national chapters have to offer. And more information to come on in-person meetings that are happening out there in the world. Um, and they're on our radar for um, our future as well. Uh, so when, when the time is right and everyone's feeling safe and ready, uh, we, will, we will be making in-person meetings happen here as well. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We're so excited. He was supposed to be one of those in-person people back in March and, and, and one of the first things that that I personally was involved with in terms of canceling when, when this whole coronavirus mess start, ha started happening. Uh, John Register, he's a Paralympic silver medalist, a Gulf War veteran, and U.S. Department of State Sports Envoy. This man is a maximizer. I'm proud to introduce to you John Register. John, thanks for being here today. Oh my gosh, BJ, thank you so much for what an opportunity to be with all of you all around. the I've heard from Julie and, and from others like y'all love where I am right now, right? And it is a virtual background. We are in remote environments and, you know, just to kind of get me a, give me a sense of where everybody is uh, coming from today and where you're remoting in from, just put in the chat box right there. I wanted to see, I have, my, I have a monitor right here. Where are you from? I know we have some folks in Colorado. Just put your city. I know we have somebody that's from Alabama. Just put that right in the chat box. I'd love to see what is happening and where Raleigh, North Carolina, Denver, Colorado, Steve's from Denver. We have Pam in Colorado Springs, Samantha in Colorado Springs, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I was born, actually, in Jewish Barnes Hospital, Alberta, Alabama. So, you know, thank you for, you know, putting that in. This is a way that we all get a chance to just show up and we can show up differently and all these pixel screens. The other thing is, which is cool, is you get a chance that not everybody is in the same spot, right? So uh, BJ Bliss is, is right here on, on my screen. So I want you to point to BJ, everybody point to BJ on your screen. Just point to BJ, where's BJ? <laughs> in the pixel, somebody, somebody going up, down, around, they're all around town. So we're all in the, in the pixel environment and like, you know, we got people over there, people over there up and down. And so we got the Brady Bunch that's happening right now. I'm gonna quickly share my screen with you because I wanna get through some, some really amazing information, I think, when you talk about embracing life's new normal. Uh, this is something that's really dear, near and dear to my heart. And I, I wanna just uh, make sure that we all are kind of on the same page. So as we're talking about amputating fear and embrace this new normal mindset, uh, that's where we, we are right now. I mean, we're in this, this amazing experience where uh, when you look at the resilience of people right now, a lot of folks are looking at that from a standpoint, what I look at it from is like maybe from an Olympian or Paralympian standpoint, because if Olympians and Paralympians uh, aren't resilient, they don't get a chance to push into the next thing. So what, what do I mean by that? They, the, the games have been postponed from 2020 in Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. 
to uh, 2021. So that means their whole world has shifted. They have been on a, a pathway to train for four years, eight years for this one moment in time. And it's really critical for them to uh, maximize and then execute on the date that they have been pushing towards. Now that has shifted out one whole cycle, one whole year away. But I've, I've recognized as an Olympian and Paralympian myself, that if Olympians and Paralympians are training four years from today, the way they are training today, they've already lost the medal. They've already lost the medal. So how do we get that resolve? How do we get that resilience? How do we push to, to that other side? And that's what we're going to really, really be talking about today. It takes a relentless, a relentless focus. And that's, um, and that's powerful. So, cause this has been a hard year. It's been a hard year of shifting. It's been a hard year of, you know, all the things that, that we wanted to do. In, in my case, uh, in the, the meetings industry case, in your case, we saw everything just stop. And that pause, that stop has decimated so much of what we do. I mean, when all the dates I was lined up, 2019, I was out there, had a great band of year. I left the United States Olympic Committee where I'd worked for 15 years, went off on my own as far as a professional speaker, professional communicator, had a great year 2019, began investing in 2020. Uh, and then at, in March, crash, everything stopped. So now I'm freaking out for a little bit, but you got to figure out how and what the next thing might be. Um, so what we, when we hear these words of uncertainty, we hear these words of, you know, I don't know what tomorrow might bring. Where that's coming from is, is, a, is a place of fear. Uh, because we're not in control and we are exhausted. Uh, and over and over again, we're just trying to figure it out. And the, and, the, and next week doesn't hold the same thing that this week held. And this week doesn't hold what last week held. Uh, and we have to really understand that we are in a stage where we're, we're going over and over again. And we're really trying to push into these existence. Uh, so I had to shift with all my dates gone. You did too colleagues trying to figure out this whole Zoom environment and remote locations and, and different platforms from Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever the platform might be, WebEx, people had to really begin figuring that out. And that new normal mindset is really how we amputate and go from that fear to freedom. So on a scale of one to 10, in the chat box, just one to 10, how are you feeling? How are you feeling right now? You know, we have 26 people on, how are you feeling right now? We have Michigan on guard in the God's road. I love that, right? Rob Moore, Tammy Page is on there right there. But just put in the chat box how you're feeling on a scale of one to 10. One is, is you know, I'm horrible. 10 is awesome, off the charts, great. So seven, eight, good. We're, we got some sevens and some eights right there. Uh, five, yeah, five, eight, five, five. So I'm about a five. <laughs> I'm about a five. I want to be honest, I'm about five, maybe a, maybe a six. Uh, when I first started out, I had a lot of great things, a lot of content being produced. And then as it waned on, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, really? What is happening here? So I'm about a five, five or six. And I know that there is relief that's coming. There's a hope and expected end that's coming. But we have to go through this process. Um, so we have five, eight, seven, seven, six. So thank you for sharing that. So let's take a, a advantage of this environment. Uh, let's take advantage to, to push into the courage. Uh, I'm doing things so differently right now. I have my whole setup. I got lights coming here. I got the green screen behind me. I got two monitors. I have my chat box over here. I have a whiteboard over there. So it's all about, not so much about the technology, even though we can use it. For me, it's really about delivering the experience. How can I come into your environment where we just saw those pixels and truly make that impact and that difference. On your Zoom, you can actually, you know, move my slides to the, to the side and you can make myself a little, a little bit larger. You can figure out all these, these things in this environment. But I had to understand this, you know, from what I was thinking about right now is how do you make the shift? And for me, making the shift was all about this long jump story about how I shifted from a world-class athlete into a, a amputee and then back to a world-class athlete. And I wanted to share one of the stories I had with you, but I'm not gonna do it from right here. I'm gonna do it from one of our great parks that's right here in Colorado Springs. So take a listen real quick to this short little video. 
In 1996, I had made the Paralympic swim team. Now, the Paralympic Games are for those athletes with physical disabilities and visual impairments. And at those games, while I was swimming and trying to figure out this whole swim thing, I looked at closed circuit television. It was a monitor right in the, in the area. Uh, and on this monitor was this gentleman who was on the long jump runway. And this gentleman, he intrigued me. Why? Because he was an above the knee amputee like myself. Um, and I was really intrigued because I was a 27 foot long jumper when I was at the University of Arkansas. And I really wanted to learn how to run and jump again on an artificial limb, but I had never seen it before. Didn't even know it was possible. But this gentleman starts taking off down the long jump runway, running leg over leg faster and faster. And he comes to the, the, the takeoff board, he hits the board, he leaps up into the air and at the apex, the height of his flight, his artificial leg flies off. <laughs> Now, I have never seen this before. So he lands here and his artificial leg lands about three feet up in front of him and the entire crowd goes dead silent. Remember like the movie Home Alone and Macaulay Caulco? But that long jumper, he turns back to the official and says, so where are you gonna measure my jump from? From right here or my artificial leg landed up there? And I said, oh my gosh, that is such a brilliant attitude to have. Think about that the attitude that he has to say, I am so comfortable in who I am with all eyes on me, with what just happened and my leg flying off, I have the wherewithal to go back and ask the official kind of a humorous question. Can we get there? Can we be that way? I began to use this metaphorically in my life to say, you know what, John, you're, in the, you're on the swim team, but you've been a four-time All-American. You have twice been to the Olympic trials. You have nine gold medals from Armed Forces competition. Why are you swimming? You're doing something very excellent, but you're not taking full advantage of who and what your capabilities are. How about you? Let's dialogue about that. So let's let's think about that, right? Uh, here's an opportunity where we are in a, in the space where we're having this hard time shifting. And I had to shift during that time. I'm trying to think to myself, what has been going on? And why am I in the swim venue when I could be back on the track? And it wasn't that I could just jump back into it because before we move, before we actually uh, to go do the things that we desire to do in our lives again, we really have to take an assessment. We have to go back and, 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 and lay another foundation. And I believe that strongly because I didn't know how to run an artificial limb. I didn't know how to, that, that what was going to happen. I was going to go to the Paralympic Games four years from now. I've had a vision for it. It's just like in COVID-19, we have a vision that we have a hope and expectancy that things are going to work out. So courage is not that you are not afraid, It's but it's rather acting despite the fear. So we all move through this courage and in this courage moment to push into these other environments. So what are you thinking about right now? So what has been your, like, what has been your greatest shift during COVID-19? What has been your greatest shift during COVID-19? So put that in the chat box. I want to see some of those, those uh, answers that are going on. Because um, I think it's important for us to know where we are in this particular environment. I was doing something at a very excellent level. I was swimming. I was on the Paralympic swim team 27 months after having my left leg amputated. But now watching somebody else on this long jump runway, something I had done at the University of Arkansas, shifted my mindset that this is what I, the path I need to be on. So I could take all those tools that I had before and then shift them. Establishing a whole new routine, Sarah says. Social distancing and working from home is a, is a tie. Yeah, right. Uh, working from the home office, another one. Learning, <laughs> learning Zoom. Yeah, Julie, right, for sure. Uh, and all these other platforms that I have. Working from home, trying to figure life out. I mean, I can't even imagine having young tykes and becoming a teacher while I got to work uh, for my company and, and then having you know, a spouse that's got to work for this. It's just all these things that are happening. All these shifts are happening because of COVID-19. But can we begin to really see the opportunities despite the obstacle? Needing to become an expert on safety and wellness. Yes, that's what Jay says. Shifting away from in-person interactions to build relationships. That is, I mean, how do you build a relationship when we're so far apart from each other? Here's a really cool thing that I've been discovering. I used to tell my kids, get off the dog on the computer, shut the games down. <laughs> but they were playing games 
with people interacting all around the world. And guess what? Now I'm in that environment. And I see that we can have these interactions. We can see individuals, you can see these people right with us. And I think that's a powerful thing and a powerful lesson that we can connect, but we have to be forthright. We have to be intentional about it. Stores being out of food supplies, absolutely weird, right? In the United States, we have food supply shortages. So here's what I had to learn uh, in, during this whole time. And it happened in a story um, that I was in a gate waiting area in, um, oh, where was I? I was in the Washington Dulles International Airport. So as I'm, as I'm in the Washington Dulles International Airport, I'm there uh, and my mindset was I, I was, I had just become an amputee. I'm like 27 months ago. I'm about to go down to Atlanta, Georgia for this Paralympic Games thing. And I'm looking at my new teammates, about 60 of us in the gate waiting area here in, in, um, in Washington Dulles. And all I could see were people with disabilities. All I could see were those individuals that were blind. They were paralyzed. They had cerebral palsy. And of course, like myself, they were amputees. And I began to think to myself, what is the value? What is the benefit of being on this team? I wanna be on the Olympic team, not this Paralympic team. In fact, I'm sitting next to a gentleman. He's in a beautiful three-piece Armani suit. He's got gator skin shoes on. He, he's pulling a Louis Vuitton bag and he's talking so loud on a cell phone that I just wanted to reach out and touch him. But I kept my hands to myself. Value, benefit of being on this team. Well, the gate agent, she gets up and she goes to the lectern and she says, ladies and gentlemen, flight number 300 is now ready for passenger boarding. Well, everyone, who needs a little bit more time and assistance, please get up and board the aircraft at this time. Well, 60 of my teammates got up and began to walk down the jet bridge. And I said, oh, benefit number one. Now that's a perk. So I went on the airplane, took my seat about the 17th row, like the window seat, 17F, I'm sitting down and I'm watching this amazing spectacle of all my teammates boarding the aircraft. And as they're boarding, I'm noticing that the blind they're being led on by their teammates by following their shoulders. I noticed that those that have cerebral palsy, they're using the backs of the chairs of the, the seats to make it to their seats. Those who are in wheelchairs, they're being guided on in aisle chairs. And then I see Tree. Now Tree is a member of the wheelchair basketball team. He is a bilateral amputee, meaning that both legs, both of his legs are missing below his knee. But Tree stands about six feet, eight inches tall. But I get it. Tree can be a tree at 6'8 or a stump at 4'3, depending upon which legs he picks out of his closet in the morning time. So he has those stilt legs on. He stops at seat 7C, sits down, pops his artificial legs off, hands them to the flight attendant, who then places his legs up into the overhead bin. But I got it. Benefit number two. More leg room. <laughs> More leg room. And as the flight attendant then looks back at Tree and says, Tree, may I help with anything else? And Tree says, no, ma'am, I'm good, I'm good. Off she walks back through the red curtains to bring all the tabs on board, all the temporarily able-bodied individuals. That's most of you, you folks. So when she goes out to the, to, the, the, to the aircraft to go bring them on, Tree now being four or three, he jumps up into a seat. He takes those long basketball arms and hoists himself up to the overhead bin. He climbs in, lays prone next to his legs, closes the bin door. 17F. I catch eyes with Amy, my swim teammate. Amy, she puts her head down, she twirls her thumbs like they have done this a thousand times before. So I'm on the edge of my seat. Who's gonna sit in that seventh row? And people are going to the back of the plane. Tabs, they're, they're filling out side to side. And then we have our winner, Mr. Armani Suit. He's still pulling that Louis Vuitton bag, he has. Uh, and he's still talking on that cell phone. And he stops at the 17th row and he discovers that the attache will not fit underneath his seat back pocket of 17B, which is his seat, so he must go to the overhead bin where our friend Tree has been lying prone for the last five minutes. And when he goes to lift that latch, boom, out Tree pops. And Armani jumps from the seventh row all the way back to the four, 17th row where I'm at. He slips on those gator shoes and I catch eyes with back with Amy. Amy says, oh, that's pretty good, John. The last guy I made to row number 10. That is a new world record. And as Armani picks all this stuff up, he goes back up to the seventh 
the, the seventh row, where Tree, no joke, has his hand on his chin. Those little legs are crossed. And he says to Mr. Armani, I'm sorry, sir, but this overhead bin space has been filled. Now, as I'm laughing and I'm cracking up, I began to think about my attitude just a few minutes earlier. When I was the one out in the gate waiting area, really devaluing my teammates because I wanted to be on the Olympic team and not the Paralympic team. It looked like I was gonna have a lot more fun on the Paralympic team than I ever was gonna have on the Olympic team. And this was really the process of beginning to shift my perspective. The perspective of knowing that things have changed for me and I'm not going back to the way it used to be. I will never get my leg back again. And in this shifting up perspective, I began to understand that I needed to value and appreciate the time in which I was in in this moment. Because people are always trying to push into these things, but they're trying to bring baggage with them. And we hear it by people saying, I just can't wait till things get back to normal. When things get back to normal, everything will be fine. I can't wait till we get to the new normal, right? We see these things happening all the time, but we have to look at it from a very, a very different lens, in my opinion. And so back in the chat box, when I told that story, what was it about it? What first came into your mind that made you think differently? So just the first thing that popped into your mind when I was sharing that story about Tree going up the overhead bin, what part of that story resonated with you and why? I'm not sure. Can we actually open up for people to, to, uh, to, to share and, and talk? Can we like raise a hand on this one? I'd love to do that. I want to hear what people are thinking. You able to do that, Tracy? So we have Julie's talking. Anybody have a, a question? Just raise a hand and we'll get, I want to get you, I want to get to some questions here. I'm going to stop the share just for a second. Yeah, if you go to reactions, you can raise your hands. Yeah, go to on them. Right in the reactions, right? Yep, you can do that. What value can you add to create a new norm? Absolutely right. right. Um, okay, Eric, see you. Uh, stores being out of food supplies. So, what questions do you have? What question around that, uh, around creating this? What's, what, was the, what was that story that first came to your, your mind? Who wants to share? If not, we're gonna go back into the presentation. So you got, who wants to raise a hand? I wanna give you 10 more seconds. Okay, from Julie's parent, okay. Julie, uh, Tree is confident in himself, absolutely. Tree's confident. And that's the way that we have to show up. We have to show up confident. How does he get that way? Tree was showing up so confident in who he is. It did not matter how I was perceiving or treating him. And we can relate that to the environment that we're in right now, that we can show up in a very confident way that from that, that moment, uh, from our confidence, oh, that's nice. We got, um, is that, uh, who is that? Is that from the Jetsons? Is that from, first from the Jetsons? Um, we can show up so confident that it is, it is amazing that we can begin to bring other people over to the other side and not show up in the fear of what of what we uh, of what we think that we need to be in. So let's go back into the presentation right now, and I have want to just kind of move this this uh, this forward. So as um, let me make sure we got the shares was right. Okay. Um, so this whole thing about this new normal, right? This new normal. I look at this very different, where most people are using this term as a destination, I do not see the new normal as a destination. I only see it as a plateau to grow. So why did I say that? New, for me, is no prior point of reference. It's very tough and resilient mindset to put yourself in no prior point of reference, because we want to think about the good old days. We want to think about 2019. We want to think about the sales that we were going to have in 2020. And that mindset will hold us stagnant from moving forward. The normal then is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action. So here's what I mean. We must have some type of a ritual that elevates to a rhythm and the rhythm elevating us to our rides. We have to have the floor of the ceiling become our floor as we push off into this new, uh, this new space, this new existence. So the new normal, therefore, what, like I said before, it's not a destination. 
it is only a plateau to grow. So let's take a listen. And as we get ready to, to look at this next part, this next video, this conversation, as we go back to our park again uh, to have our conversation, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about this new normal as a des not a destination, but as a plateau to grow. And we're going to look at this, this, uh, this quick video as we go back out. It's about, 12, it's about a 12-minute piece, but I want you thinking about how this is impacting you in your day-to-day -day operations. So let's go back out to the park. October the 30th, 2000, I'm sitting in a gate waiting area in the San Francisco International Airport. I'm reading a USA Today newspaper. I'm wearing shorts, which has exposed my artificial leg. Boop, boop. <laughs> in earshot of me, about 20 yards off to my left, your right, two boys about five and seven are talking to their mother and these two boys have made a new discovery. Mommy, mommy, look at that man's leg over there. See that man's leg over there? There goes Robot Man. <laughs> so I chuckled. But I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. Then something else happened. There began to be this outer speak conversation, which really should have remained inner speak conversation, about the two boys, five and seven, who had just discovered Robot Man. Shut those kids up. So impolite to stare. Such a bad mother. Leave that poor man alone. I said, wow, now that's interesting. But I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the woman get up and begin to move in my direction. Now, I thought she was going to do like the song said and just walk on by. But no, she stops in front of me, leans in and says, excuse me, sir. It looks like you've overcome so much adversity. My children are fascinated by your leg. You're such an inspiration. Would you please tell them what happened? In that moment, I was taken aback. No one has ever asked me such a direct question in front of all these people, loud enough for them to hear all the naysayers that were there that were talking this inner speak, outer speak conversation. And in the space between her question and my response, I began to try to figure out how I was going to answer her question. And the space gave me pause. Why did she think I'd overcome so much adversity? Maybe I was just born this way. And why did she think that I was such an inspiration? I could be an ax murderer. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> yet. <laughs> And then why was everybody else that had that inner speak conversation, that was now outer speak conversation, leaning in? And in that space between her question and my response, I found my answer. I did not overcome the adversity. You see, six and a half years earlier, I was lying on a hospital bed in Wichita, Kansas at the Wesley Medical Center. My wife, Alice, was holding on to my left hand. My parents were on the opposite side of the bed and my son John Jr. was at the foot of the bed. Dr. Randy Mullins, he walks into the room, he's wearing a white lab coat, thesoscope around his neck, clipboard in his hand. He takes one look at me and sees my countenance because the pain that I am in is tremendous. And as he looks at me, he says, John, you have, a t you have a tough choice to make. You can either keep your leg and, I and you can use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life, or I can amputate your leg and you can use a prosthesis for the rest of your life. Now, what kind of choice is that? You see, just seven days earlier on May 17th, 1994, I'm on top of the world. <laughs> I am on the Army's world-class athlete program team. I am a four-time All-American, twice have been the Olympic trials. USA Track and Field News has picked me to make the Olympic team one of the favorites to watch for the 1996 Games because I'm top eight, top 20 in the world. And I'm doing my shakeout in the 400-meter hurdles. And I'm in Hayes, Kansas, and the wind's blowing kind of hard that day, and I'm having trouble with my steps. So on the 400-meter hurdles, which is one time around the track over 10 barriers spaced 35 meters apart 
with a 45 meter lead into the first hurdle and a 40 meter runoff on the last hurdle. I'm approaching each hurdle at the speed of about 8.7 meters per second, which equates to what? If you put in the chat box <laughs> uh, 19 miles an hour, you'd be absolutely correct if you didn't do a Google search on it. So I'm going pretty fast. Somebody probably said pretty fast out there. So I'm having trouble with my steps. My right leg's coming up, my left leg's coming up. And sometimes in hurdles as in life, we just want things to stay the same. And I want that right leg to come up because that was my dominant leg to go down the back stretch for this hurdle race. So I get in the blocks and I do my one last proverbial pass. I'm gonna shut it down after this one. And I come out of the blocks and I get my steps to the first hurdle. I'm on, right leg leads. Second hurdle. 13 steps in between the hurdle. Again, right leg leading, I'm on again. And then I feel the Kansas wind push against me, but I push back against that Kansas wind. And I realize I'm gonna be short and have to take the hurdle with my left leg. No problem, I'm ambidextrous, I can do that. Don't want to, but I can. So off the right leg I go, across the hurdle with my left leg. When I land, this time I hear and my body sails and twists in the air and I see my left shin pass in front of my face. My shoulders hit the ground and I bounce to a halt. I did a quick once over my body, you know, my, my shoulders are okay, my, my waist is okay. When I saw my knee, the patella had risen three inches up my femur bone where my left leg was now canted across my right with my foot touching the black surface of the track. Now let me stick a pin in the story right there and pause for just one moment. I'm gonna show you a graphic. And on this graphic, you're gonna see the actual injury of my leg because a sharp lieutenant named Michelle Dickens took nine pictures that day. And the next picture I'm gonna show you is a picture of that injury. But if you're a little bit squeamish, you can look away from your computer monitor right now wherever you're watching this, this stream from. So as you can see, on the bottom of the picture is my foot on the black surface of the track. If you come up my shin bone, you will see the dislocation of my knee, the left knee right there. That's not an elbow, ladies and gentlemen, that's my knee. And then when you come all the way down to the, the bottom left-hand side of the corner, you see my head, my friend Dino's head is resting on my head, my friend um, Ben Curitan, is kind of on there with, with Dino. Roz is holding my hand, and then I have no idea whose ashy legs those are <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the picture. Let me step back onto the track. The only thing I could think about in that moment was just get up. Come on, John, you can do it. It's okay, you got it, you, can, you, you got this, you can get, to, you can get your stuff up, come on, you can, you can oh, God, oh, oh, God! And then 90 minutes later, with my friends singing songs and hymns to keep me calm. 90 minutes later, as they were trying to get me medical attention, 90 minutes later, the ambulance comes. And I'm put in the back and I'm whisked off to Hayes Medical Center where another doctor in a white lab coat comes in, takes one look at me and says, Mr. Register, looks like you got a bit of a problem. I'm gonna have to fix that. So he bore down on my crooked leg. We're gonna do this on three. One, my leg ballooned up, I passed out, and for the next few days, seven days, I don't really remember too much what happened. I was medevac to Wesley Medical Center. I underwent several vein graft operations. I don't remember when my wife arrived. I don't remember when my son got there or my parents. What I do remember is laying in that hospital bed with Alice, her hand, on my left hand, my parents on the opposite side of the bed, little John Jr., five and a half years old, the foot of the bed, and Dr. Mullen saying, you got a tough choice to make. Now, it was the pain that spoke first because my male deductive reasoning said, get rid of the leg, get rid of the pain. <laughs> so I turned to Dr. Mullins and I said, I know it has to be amputated, and he went in right away. Two days later, I woke up at 11 o'clock at night and I was in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reasoned. I just wanted something to knock it out. So I saw the morphine drip button on the opposite side of the bed. I just wanted to roll over to depress the button 
but I was too weak from the surgery to do so. But I saw the nurse's station right outside my door, and I thought if I'd call out to them, but the tubes that have been down my throat make the sound too inaudible to get their attention. So there I lay in my bed for the next eight hours with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What's my identity? Is my wife gonna stick around? Will, will my son still see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the army? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. And at eight o'clock, Dr. Randy Mullins, he walks back in the room, takes one look at me and sees I've done a 180 degree shift. He immediately calls my wife, Alice, who is over at the hotel trying to manage me, herself, John Jr., her mother-in-law, she should have been told I was awakened, but because I couldn't speak and because no one had come in and checked on me, you know, in the moments that I was, you know, in and out of that consciousness, she didn't know. She had been there all the time. On top of that, this saint of a woman has just gotten a call from her employer saying that she's been away from her job too long caring for me and they've just terminated her position. So she comes running over and it takes Dr. Mullins and my wife Alice 45 minutes to get me out of that bed into a wheelchair wheeled out to an inaccessible playground where I'm parked watching, forced to watch my wife and my son play on the swing sets and I couldn't push myself out of that chair. It's the first time I felt devalued, dejected, disabled and I lost it started crying uncontrollably. My wife, Alice, who sees me struggling, she comes running over to me, kneels down beside me and says, babe, what is going on? What is wrong? And I started articulating to her everything that was going on in my life the night before. And then she spoke the words that stopped my downward spiral. You know what, John? We're gonna get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. <laughs> And when she spoke those words, I remember she baselined my entire existence with those words. And as I started contemplating and thinking about this, this new normal concept that she was just kind of throwing into my, my life at this point, John Jr. jumps off the swing, hits the ground, comes running over the little five and a half year old legs. Hey dad, you see my big jump? You see my big jump, dad? And in those 20 yards, he had just validated me as his father and he had just created his new normal. And that's exactly what I had to do. I had to create my new normal. Let's take a pause right there and just unpack what we've just heard. So as I put in the chat box, I just want you to take a moment to pause and reflect because that's, a, that's a, the, the, the longest piece but I think it's important for us to understand and for me to kind of go first in understanding what goes on in a person's life when injury happens, when trauma happens. We've all been through some type of trauma. And so what do you believe it was that I overcame? What is it? What do you believe? I wanna see it in the chat box. What is it that you believe I overcame on that day when I had that leg go from flopping around, injury, to the amputation. What is it that you believe I overcame? So I wanna see that. Acceptance of the situation that things will be okay. Thanks, Tammy, yeah. Your reflection of yourself, absolutely. Fear, yeah, Xander, fear. Hopelessness, says Tracy, yes. So all these things are going on in my head. Low self-worth, right, I didn't know who I was. And, and how many of us feel like that right now with COVID-19 and all these things are happening, we don't have this control as we we're saying. Overcame the expectation of what I can and cannot do. Absolutely, Cheryl. Uh, uncertainty, yes, what was, going to, what was going to be happening. So in my life at that moment, the thing I was really struggling with were my individual fears. Who am I now? What's my identity, as we, we heard in the, in the chat? Is my wife gonna stick around? Is my son still gonna see me as his dad? Do I still have a job in the army? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. The second thing were the, the negative fears that other people were placing onto me. Other people believing for me what I could or could not do, which was based upon what they believed they could or could not do if they were the amputee. So many people try to pull us back 
into their bubble to make them feel safe. They don't want to step out. They don't want to stretch. They feel just comfortable. And we hear it by people saying, we just got to get things back to normal. When you get back to normal, everything will be fine. And then society, what was I listening to in society that made me believe my fears in the first place? We have these things that are in our society that make us fearful. And that these are the critical things that we have to look at and push into. Because if we say something out of fear, we have to identify A, where it's coming from, and B, why we're listening to it. Is there truth to that? Was it when I watched the Walt Disney movie and I see Captain Hook, Captain Hook's an amputee, he got his arm bit off by TikTok the crocodile. Um, he's the villain in Peter Pan, but he's a villain. Am I a villain because I'm now an amputee? So we do all these associations, all these things, we, even, even with the um, COVID-19, then all of a sudden we had the murder of George Floyd. And all these fears started resurfacing once again. Where do the fears come from? How can I push into these spaces? If it's driving the, the outcome and the action, then we really have something that we have to look at. And I think it really comes from resilience. And resilience, when we look at this word, is not the rubber band snapping back to its, or coming back to its original shape, because in my case, my rubber band broke. In resilience, if you look at this word, I said in, my, in that little presentation that the, the hurdles are a 10 hurdle race in the high hurdles and the one lapper, the 400 meter hurdles. If you look at the word resilience, resilience has 10 letters. And I believe these 10 letters can reflect and represent the obstacles that are in our life that we have to get over to get us to embrace a new normal lifestyle. Now these 10 letters can be represent any words for you, but I'm gonna share the words for me. The, the starter or the announcer before the race will always say quiet for the start. And embedded in the word resilience is the word silence. We have to hear our own voice first. And one of the promises I made to you was gonna, I was gonna give you these 10 power words of resilience that I think that we have to move forward with. Now, again, these are my words. You can choose to have other words. And they kind of come from what we're talking about embedded in the word resilience is that word silence. So I believe we have to have a ritual. A ritual develops into a rhythm and a rhythm elevates us to our rise. We also have to have endurance because as we are looking at, you know, thinking that we're going to get out of this within side of three to four months, we're now looking into 2021 in some cases and even maybe in the middle part of that year. And we have to endure this race for the long haul. And that silence is critical to hear our own voice before we begin to have this ingenuity about ourselves to move out and see which direction we're going to go. Who are we going to listen to in this environment? And the listening is critical because most of us listen without listening. We listen to talk and try to respond. And that is not the way that we want to actually have it. It's listening with an, an, an absolute intensity, an absolute intensity of how we're going to move forward in this environment and that means we have to engage with it without the engagement we can just sit at home it's like me like i said i was a five this morning i did not want to get out of bed i want to keep the covers over my head and say oh my gosh do i really have to push yes you do you have to do that and how because you're never going to yield to that unexpected you're going to always push into that environment and that takes courage now you see there are nine right there and we're almost to the, that last e and i think the last e for me is is critical because all of these together helps us to elevate and evolve in our areas of life. So if we go back to that, that last slide we're talking about, these fears that we have, we believe we have to rebuild. Rebuilding language sounds like if I just get it back to the way it used to be, everything will be fine. We don't get that back. Because had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. I don't. What was it that I overcame? But we're starting to redefine who we are in this moment. How many of you are out there redefining who you are in this, in this COVID moment? We said that earlier of, of what you're feeling like on that scale of one to 10. We're redefining ourselves based upon a false premise that things are going to make it back to normal or we're going to a new normal destination, quote unquote destination. But this is the linchpin. This is the critical piece. The redefining moment is so important because it's, we're going to do it after three, uh, three minutes, three hours, three years, three decades. At some point, we're going to decide who it is we're going to show up as. Are we going to go back to our fears of ourselves, fear of others, and fear of society? Or are we going to release ourselves and choose what it is to amputate our fear, to release ourselves 
to this new normal mindset, this rebirth. And this rebirth is me understanding that I now have an artificial leg. I have to relearn how to walk. I have to relearn how to run, relearn how to jump. And that's going to take time. But once I get there, I now have a resolve. I am now resolute in who I am. No more am I going to go backwards to what other people are believing for me. You need to come forward and catch up to where I am. And this equals our liberation. That liberation, we understand once the cage is open, just like I had some birds on my front porch, if you would have looked at my LinkedIn profile last year, last week, you would have seen my little baby birds that were out there, not mine, you know, they were up there on the porch and they imprint on our house every year. There were four little uh, hatchlings in the nest and three of them left the nest a day early before the last one. The last one took a little bit longer to get out. And I, I was like, hey, dude, you need to catch your brothers and sisters because I don't think mom was coming back here to feed you. But when we're released, we have this freedom. We've left the nest and we now are strong enough to do what? To give back to others, to, to have this existence, to liberate somebody else. It is our legacy that we leave. This red line that goes from the individual fear to our liberation runs straight through that redefining moment because that is the most critical piece of what we have to go through. It is, we, there's, you're not going to get it in a book. You're not going to get it 10 points in a, in a, in a close on, on it. You have to do that work. It is personal to you and it's up to you to get up in the morning, to get out of bed like I had to do this morning and push into this new normal existence, this new normal space. So what do you think? Um, what do you fear you, that you need? What fear do you need to amputate to embrace this new normal mindset? What fear do you personally, your, your issue, yourself, need to amputate to embrace a new normal mindset? Put that in the chat box. I want to hear what you have to say. What do you think you have to overcome uh, to, to embrace this new normal mindset? Because usually it's not the thing that we're thinking about. It's not the, it's not the amputation. That's not what I had to overcome because I'd have my leg back, as I said. What I had to overcome were my fears around it, my uncertainty. So what do you think that was? What do you think that is for you, you know, as, as we're going through and about to wrap this conversation? What is it for you? I want to see some, somebody in the chat box there. What fear do you need to amputate to embrace your new normal mindset? We had, I think, you know, some of the things that were said earlier, insecurities about future, low self-worth, uncertainty, all those things are relevant and can be there. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to go the other side. Sometimes it's hard to live courageously when other people don't want to live courageously with you. It's hard to stand up and become an ally for a group of, of individuals when you have a family history that says that we're, we're, we're never going to be allyship with that. And so you have to go out from there. So Jay says, you know, discomfort and conflict. Absolutely. And that's a conflicted situation. And that's why it's so hard. It's easy to be courageous when, you, when you're out there on your own. And you can just charge off. It's hard to be courageous when no one comes with you. And that's where it gets. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's why I say you can't get that in a book. You have to choose to do that. So let's finish up the conversation and figure out what happened. Okay, I got Holly said, learning how to learn, uh, learn with groups virtually, a new way of learning technology. Absolutely. One of the things I do and try to do like on this particular slide right here is we, if we have more time, we go out into groups and we would talk about this from a group perspective, have a group leader, and I would bounce around to each one of those groups in order to have this dialogue and this discussion to pull us through to the other side and to see where everybody is. Having to change my approach instead of banging my head against the wall and expecting a different result. Absolutely, Dana. Have another story around that uh, with this guy named Gong who banged his head against the wall, won the gold medal. Um, he had no arms, in fact. So... You're all exactly right. All these things, the sphere of this new normal, this new challenge and, and these challenges that Xander says, you're, you are exactly right, but we have to jump. We have to push. And whatever that looks like for us, that's what's going to happen. So here's what happened to me after I began to push into that space and at the Paralympic Games. And then four years later, I wanted to, I wanted to show you what that four-year process was like. So let's go back up to the park for our last conversation. So the new normal is really about no prior point of reference that's what new is that we're not going to hold on to our past performances our past successes our past failures that's gone and normal is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought idea or an action and so when we're talking about the new normal it's how are you pivoting how what are you doing right now to increase to the next level i took the new normal philosophy and began swimming for physical therapy i got so fast in the water that I somehow fluked up, messed up, and made the Paralympic swim team. So instead of going to the Olympic Games as a 400-meter hurdler, I went to the Paralympic Games as a swimmer. 
African-American swimmer. In my book, we just didn't do that sport too much. <laughs> and it was at those games that I saw athletes running and jumping on artificial limbs, and that birthed the idea of how I could press more into this new normal, right? It's, it's because it's not a destination. It's only a plateau to grow. So I had a leg made for running. And after four years, learning how to run, learning how to jump, getting myself fit and fast, I wound up making the Paralympic team and I went to Sydney, Australia, and these were the results. Let's take a look at the men's long jump F42 final starting list and Lucas Christen from Switzerland is the dominant one in this field. He holds both the world and Paralympic record in this event. Victor Goriansson from Sweden is up now, ready for his third attempt. It's not a bad effort. He's pretty satisfied with it. 4.89. It's actually a season best for the Swede. Here's the man to beat. He is the world record holder, jumping 5.43 in 98 in Birmingham. Well, he's pleased the crowd. He's happy with that one. And so he should be. He smashed his world mark with 5.57, a new world mark. Well, the pressure's really on now for John Register from the USA. 5.57, the mark to beat. Nice lead up, but it's short. He's not able to take the gold from Kristen, but he does move into second spot. So here are the results of the men's long jump final. Gold to Kristen, silver to Register, and Goriansen home with the bronze. Now, I have a confession to make. Every time I see that video, I do think I'm going to win the gold medal, <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> Back to silver. Uh, and, you know, that took a lot of effort, 20 years worth of training and dedication and losing a limb and coming back and that we can get back i could get back to that healthy and active lifestyle again and, and and parallel what it used to be wasn't the same pathway to olympic sport but there was a parallel pathway what's that parallel pathway that you might have here's how you know when you're on the other side so we know the language of fear and the uncertainty and that is i can't wait till things get back to normal i can't wait till we we get back there the, the language of surety of resolve that we're talking about is a reporter she comes down and she asks me after the the events over with she says john you know i knew you when you ran for the southwest conference in the university of arkansas you ran against some of the best athletes and jumped against some of the best athletes you ran against michael johnson gold medalist in 1996 you you jumped against carl lewis one of the greatest athletes in the in the uh, in, in the world do you think with artificial limb technology that you could do that again could you, you could compete with those individuals. And I said, um, no, I don't think I could. However, maybe your question should be, uh, if Michael Johnson or Carl Lewis, God forbid, lost a leg, could they run as fast or jump as far as I do? And that's the catch up. That's the language that you know with your employees, with the people that are in these working environments all over the place and pushing into these new spaces, that's the language where you know they've got, they got it. They're asking people to catch up to where they are because they're being innovative. They're pushing into those, those spaces in such a way that they're creating the opportunities. They're seeing the opportunities and not the obstacles that are before them. One person told me it wasn't that I was running hurdles anymore because I wasn't gonna run them anymore. It's now I'm flying over the hurdles, the, whole, the entire race. That's the way, the mindset that we have to be. So I have a free gift for each one of you out there, the infographic, the pathway from fear to freedom, as you can see there on this screen, is this pathway that goes from one all the way to 10, and it show, showcases that kind of in this, in this picture infographic of how we get there. And so there's another one out there too on, uh, on resilience, I think there's one on resilience out there as well. So if you go to uh, amputatefear.com, that will lead you into a place where you can actually get this, uh, this infographic uh, right now. So here's, a, here's the, the, the kind of, well, before I close, I want to make sure that there's nothing that we have here on, on the chat that I've missed. Uh, so fear of lack of revenues at work and uncertainty of available employment. Um, did you ever backslide on your attitude? Abs August, absolutely. This morning, I told you, I'm a five. <laughs> uh, it's not that we are there and we hold that position all the time. I mean, even as an athlete, we go up and down. There ebbs and flows to this thing. Some days I don't want to train. But I also understand that if I train in the rain or if I train in the snow, if I train when my other, when my competitor is not training, it gives me a greater competitive advantage. And that's the mindset that I have to go do. Great question. Um, 
fear of lack of rev, uh, revenues at work. Absolutely. So these, these are all real issues and, and we don't know how they're going to be resolved, but we can control what we control around that, around that space. What, what do we have to do to either eliminate or expand, think differently about the, the environment? Uh, Olympians and Paralympians, like I said, they are outspent five to one by developed countries and we still win the medal count. So it's not about the money that makes us win. It's about how we think about how we're going to do things differently. Wonder what my thoughts are for this year's Olympic athletes having to wait a year. Are they thinking, yeah, another year? <laughs> uh, no, they're not thinking, yeah, another year to train. Most are ad have adapted and they under understand. So I have a lot of thoughts around that, right? Because there's some countries that really aren't opening up again. And so that's limiting athletes' ability to train. The, usually athletes train on a four-year cycle for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And so that's been disrupted now. So they have, they have designed themselves to peak in 2020. And now it's going to be a peak in 2021. So they have to go back into their kit bag and put the base on again so that they can actually peak in 2021. That is a fantastic question, Holly. Thank you um, for, for that. So here's, here's the hero factor of this all, right? So if we go back to the woman in the airport and her two children, she's a heroine of mine. Because how much did she push into a new space and come and, and, and make an opportunity for her kids that may not have done it against all the naysayers that were out there in the gate waiting area? So she's a heroine. She changed the entire conversation. So one person can change a conversation. She changed it. All the people in the gate waiting area, they began saying, you know, how cool is that? Did you hear that story? These kids' lives will never be the same. And I began to think about it for myself and my own standpoint. Who am I now because of her interaction? Maybe I'm a little bit more forthright and not, you know, reading my proverbial USA Today newspapers and, act, and leaning in on the conversations. Change it all the time. My wife, heroin, she's the one that gave me the baseline of doing this new normal and really pushing. We've been married now 31 years and she still continues. Even this morning when I'm the five, she's saying, you can do this, babe. Just get up. It's time, time to move. She's going back to work as a flight attendant for Southwest Airlines. God bless her. Um, you know, these are the things that we, we, we're in this together and we're going to push together. So having a support system is critical. My son, John Jr., you see him over here when he's helping me on the long jump runway. And then now, as we're living out here in Colorado, he continues to impact and push and, and, and press into my life as now a 31-year-old man. I see these people around me differently now. These individuals who are help trying to support me, I don't see my leg in this picture any longer. I see that support system that's around us um, and around me. And the, ampi and the person that had the, we now know who, who Ashley's legs those are, that's the EMT guy come, coming in there. And we see Tony Sylvester in the white cap. He is a combat medic, saved over 11 lives when he was in Iraq and Afghanistan. He knows exactly what to do. And in case I open my eyes up, his eyes are locked in on me. Dino's head is on my head. He is with me. Who's on your team? Who is with you in this fight? Those are the people that you have to bring around you. When we talk about the fears that were back in the hospital. Uh, one of my fears was, you know, hey, can I have kids again? And, you know, hey, we have, we have Ashley here just graduated from the University of Northern Colorado, Greeley. Amazing young lady. She was the, the one who organized the first peaceful protest up in Denver, Colorado. Just a brilliant mind that she has. Well, Ashley's here because everything still worked. <laughs> and then John Jr., of course, has Ayana. That's my grandbaby. She calls me Fafa. Uh, and she's here with us right now. Uh, what, a, what an amazing young kid that, that's just so smart and so sharp. And I love that we can have these family experiences together because we choose to lean into these moments. So that's it about how we amputate our mindset and embrace a new normal mindset, embrace this new normal mindset of, of how we do it. The last thing I will leave you with is this, the next time you go to board an aircraft, whenever that might be, and you go to reach for the overhead bin, you just be careful because you never know what life's overhead bin has in store for you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate each and every one of you. God bless and stay safe. John, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. And, and your lessons, I feel like we've got a whole new context to look at the challenges we're all facing day to day and taking on adversity. And I, I sincerely appreciate what you've shared with us today. It, it means a lot to me and I think to all, to all of us at the group. Um, and, and even though our model for, for this summer has been free online meetings, um, we're still going to be making a donation at the end of the year in your name to our, our annual charity, which is CASA, the Court Appointed Advocates here in the Colorado Springs region. 
Um, so thank you again. Uh, to all of you who were here to share this with us today, thanks for your attendance. We've just sent out our uh, monthly survey uh, for the meeting. Please take just two minutes to fill that out and check your email box uh, if you receive that survey as a registered attendee. I wanna take a quick second to thank our attendees. Eric, I know had to jump off, but I think I saw he was in Michigan. That's so cool that he could still be here with us today, so to speak. Um, he is uh, one of our partner and sponsors. Um, he's available to book as a speaker and a photographer. I think he's just a great guy to chat with in general. Uh, our other sponsor, Jennifer Bliss from Say No More Promotions, uh, who's provided our chapter with a lot of cool stuff um, and, and more to come when we're back in person. Uh, come back August 19th is our next meeting. We're gonna be having a COVID digital strategy webinar presented by Gordon Leometz, the founder and CEO of Digital Escape. I'm sure it's gonna be informative Thanks again to everyone and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. I hope to see you all in person soon.